the thing that we all have in common is just that something that we heard or somebody we saw do something, just, you know, it made your skin do that thing and you want to do it. And the great John Jorgensen. You changed everything about the electric guitar to me. Rocket Top Tennessee. Pick one, John. I remember the first time I saw John Jorgensen play. He's one of the few guitar players who can play in any genre at all and look like that's all he does. He's this incredible musician that plays 12 different instruments at least. Um, and he's not just okay on any of them. <laughs> he's really good at every one of them. I was a professional guitarist in my 20s, and I also took a degree in bassoon, clarinet, and saxophone, so I was a classical musician as well. Music is the thing that everybody understands, everybody loves, and, and everybody can come together and grow from. There are some people that are very proficient and they play technically very well, but if they're not connected to their heart, it, it only reaches people that are interested in technique. And so many of their people don't care anything about technique. They care about the feeling. Those are the people that I want to play for. I mean, I love playing for musicians, but I'd rather touch people's hearts than their minds. John Jorgensen is a great ambassador for guitar players all around the world, you know. He's very honest, he's very open about everything, he's very dedicated, and his love for music is only beaten by his love for humanity. Yeah. <laughs> I think Tommy right now is probably one of the most important figures in the world of guitar. All right, you want to play something in E? Joe Bonamassa is really taking the blues rock mantle. He's really the head of that whole world right now. Sam created Newgrass Revival and pushed bluegrass into other directions that it hadn't been before, and thus influenced a whole other generation of mandolin players. So that's Sam Bush. <laughs> wow. Ricky Skaggs, he's carrying the mantle of traditional bluegrass. Great singer, plays fiddle, he plays acoustic guitar, electric guitar, mandolin. Actually watching one of his concerts inspired me to start a band that then became the Desert Rose Band, which was the act that kind of took me from being a local musician in California to a national and international musician and opened a lot of doors for me. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, that's This one just had the three. They hadn't done that yet. All right, John, check, check this out. Okay. okay. Oh, what that of is? course. Oh. A 12 oh. and a 10. No, and both gold. Gold yes. 12 and a gold 10. Oh. You know, it's three 10s normally, and they're kind of flappy. Right. The first time that I met Brad was at the uh, Wheeling, West Virginia Jamboree. Jamboree USA. Yeah. This would have been probably 1988, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I was playing there with the Desert Rose Band. Right? Put your humbug. British, doesn't it? It does. It's really cool. We just sold an amp and a pedal, and I don't have any rights to either one. I'm equally into amps and gear and everything as Brad is. You know, it's a it's an affliction, really. Oh, yeah. But as I toured as a country artist, no one ever even noticed Hi. till one day in Wheeling, West Virginia, and this young guy comes up and starts asking me questions. Are those Original Vox amps from England? Yes, they are. Is that a Rickenbacker? Yes, it is. I'm going to show how much of a geek I am. You had two blues recombed 50s for use in your AC50 combo you built. 
Right. You might as well not even talk. I know everything you're going to say. Yeah, I know you do. I thought, wow, this is cool. Somebody's well, asking me about my gear, finally. Like, like you, he was a student of the game and decided that if you had that, that's probably what he wanted, so. I'm a child of the 80s, and everybody had a rack and a preamp and a chorus unit that would split it so you could do stereo. And a super strat, probably. Probably. Yeah. Then you came through Wheeling, West Virginia, with two AC-30s and boss pedals and just blew my mind. And I went, that's what I want. And then my poor father had to loan me uh, <laughs> he said he had to... two grand for a couple of box amps. But he still hasn't paid me back for that amp. No, oh, serious? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> to me, it was like, that's what I want to sound like. And I have spent my entire career trying to sound like you and failing. <laughs> Like when you would do the, whether it was yeah. Austin City Limits where you'd obviously almost get lost going on one of those rants. You know yes. what I'm talking about? I, I totally I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean it no, in a great I way. Know, I know usually, that. you know, when you do a TV show like that, you usually stick to your bag of tricks. Yeah. You've never done that. No. You, you could tell you're not content to just play the solo off the record every night. No. <laughs> Like, he does a lot of hammer-ons. That's you. You did that a ton. Oh, yeah. Like where did yeah. you get it? Uh, so I know where I got it. Partially from Ray Flack. And he did, like... And I just went, okay, that's cool. Yeah. I'm having that. It almost yeah. works in any key. Oh, yeah. Because like, you, be, you could be in this. But it does. It, just, it, I know. I, I saw the greatest thing on a message board once. Somebody said, can someone tell me who his influences are about me? They said, go listen to John Jorgensen if you really want to see where the bulk of what he's trying to do comes from. And the comment under it was, just discovered Jorgensen. Oh man, did he just steal his tone or what? <laughs> it's like, yes, you're right. It's the, that's fair. I think that's fair. Any night that I've gotten too far from that thing you do, I realize I'm not happy and I need to go in reverse. That makes me. Makes you feel like you need to bill me. Well, no, it makes me really, really proud and kind of overwhelmed and. And uh, amazed, you know. That's the beauty of this instrument: is it, it really is timeless, you know. And everybody can leave their own stamp on it, and and yeah. and push it forward. You're pushing it forward every time you play. Every time I see you on no. TV, there have been times I've done irreparable damage. I, okay, the licks speak for themselves. Oh, thanks. So, how does your red AC30 sound? It's really good. The, the original? Yeah. It's not my best one, but it's really good. I think Zeppelin -y guys like the yeah. 7120. Right. And, and it's different. It's just different. Yeah. You, know? you gotta load up the car and come over to the house and we'll set them all up and goof around and guitar geek heaven. <laughs> you know, we would all be doing this for free. I would pay to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah don't know? tell anybody. I would tell, I don't have, tell anybody. I have paid to do it, you know? Right. People will say to me, who's number one for you? Who's the number one? And, I, and it's always the same answer. I can't remember who I say, but it's, uh, no, it's, it's always this man right here. <laughs> All I can say is thank you, and it, and it really, really makes me happy and proud. Well, thank you. So in country music, the electric guitar started becoming more prominent in the 40s, first with a uh, Hawaiian guitar with, with lap steel and Hawaiian guitar, which you'd hear in early Hank Williams 
Um, but then the electrified guitar started being brought in too by people like Merle Travis and Chet Atkins. And Chet Atkins uh, has a very particular style of, of picking, which is in, involves your thumb. He even normally use a thumb pick. I don't, I don't use a thumb pick, but it's this kind of alternating picking with your thumb. And that was sort of a uh, kind of fancy, but a little bit tame too. And then the uh, Leo Fender designed the, the Telecaster, and a lot of guys in Nashville started playing. Uh, the, uh, people who had been fiddle players before, like Hank Garland, and started playing kind of more uh, fancy kind of licks, fiddle kind of licks, you know. And uh, then double stops. People started liking the more twangy sound of the Telecaster, like Luther Perkins for Johnny Cash. And he would do very, very simple lines, you know, on the guitar. Very simple, but very distinctive. And then uh, players like James Burton who took the Telecaster and created licks like. Uh, mixing blues a little bit in there, you know? Uh, look, Susie Q, he came up with that lick. And he started doing a little technique called chicken picking. It sounds kind of like a chicken. And you, you kind of pick with your pick and finger fast. And then you got guys in California like Don Rich and Buck Owens, and uh, they had they they liked the really bright sound of the Telecaster too, you know. So the, the Telecaster kind of became the voice of of electric country guitar. And uh, today you have some, so many great players like Brad Paisley and Albert Lee and Vince Gill and Red Volkert um, that are just you know pushing the Telecaster as far as it can go. Um, but that's kind of an example of, of a particular style of guitar creating a whole style of music and series of licks. People like Roy Buchanan and Danny Gatton and well, I could go on and on and on, but. We'll stop for now.